I guess with my track record, I think uh, working with Al Pacino, it's really molded me kind of into the makeup artist and, you know, in a professional and personal way. Eh, bienvenido, John. Gracias por la oportunidad. Bueno, bienvenido también, Jan. Eh, quisiera poder hablar sobre un poco de los inicios de John y es sobre, bueno, cómo fue la inspiración de crear un maquillaje que tenga que ver con temas médicos. Me refiero a Basket Case y The Honja. So, can you please tell us more about that? How did you begin in the field and how your experiences eventually influenced you to create the different styles of makeup that you have applied all these years? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, I started uh, by uh, writing a fan letter to a famous makeup artist uh, whose name was Dick Smith. And Dick Smith did the makeup in The Exorcist all the you know special effects makeup and he did marlon brando and all the makeup in godfather one and two so um uh, i come from a very uh uh nobody in show business in my family so i was starting to do makeup when i was about 15 or 16 years old just working on my own so i i wrote a letter to dick smith and he actually responded to my letter and i and i tell people it was like uh Uh, being stranded on a desert island and writing a note and putting it in a bottle and throwing it into the ocean. Uh, and the USS Dick Smith went by, the ocean liner. <laughs> and some, he picked up that bottle and he called me on the telephone. And I was about 15 or 16 years old. And uh, long story short, he took me under his wing as a, as a protege. And so I was with Dick Smith. And then they, at NBC Television in New York, Uh, they were looking for an apprentice to work in the makeup department at NBC television. So Dick Smith recommended me. Uh, so right out of high school, I went to NBC and worked in the makeup department for, I guess, it's about seven years or so. And in that time, I did all the shows at NBC. But my main show was this new TV show called Saturday Night Live. Uh, so it was only on for about a year. And then I came on uh, into the makeup position. And, and that's where I started my professional career, was in television in New York City. That's... And as far as uh, the other question, as far as The Hunger and what was the other movie you mentioned? Uh, Basket Case. Oh, Basket Case. So I, I don't understand. I, 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 I'm trying to remember those jobs. It was a long time ago. The medical profession, how do, how do you see it? Uh, comparing. John, lo que me está preguntando John <ríe> es que básicamente pues le pareció curioso la relación que tú pusiste en la parte médica con las películas Basket Case y The Hunger. Entonces él te quiere preguntar a ti eh, de dónde salió esa relación, o sea, desde oh. qué perspectiva tú la encontraste. Oh, mira, en Basket Case es sobre el deformamiento médico y And the Hunger is sobre la gerontología. The, John was saying that uh, uh, that if no you medical. found like like a so medical no me link between uh, between the story and those two subjects, those two medical subjects, which in the case of basket case or the redundancy is medical deformity, and in the case of the hunger is this the medical thing of gerontology. Oh, oh, well, I never got that. <laughs> I'm a pretty simple guy. I, you know, uh, if that if that's what you get from it, that's great. I, uh, I, uh, yeah, a medical deformity basket case. Um, yes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm a very simple man, and so I just uh, I never made that connection between those two. That's interesting. That's Sorry, great. I wish I had an answer, <laughs> no. but I don't. Great <laughs> answer, man. Uh, thank you for, for the answer. Thank you. Well, that speaks volumes about the subjectivity of of one's perception when you when you see things. I guess, yeah, yeah. Perception. So, <laughs> yes. So, looking at your really vast catalog, because you do have a lot of experience on so many classics such as Dick Tracy, of course, you worked on Heat, on The Irishman, you worked on The Dark Knight as well. 
you, we were speak on in our many conversations. We were speaking about um, about diversity because I asked you once, uh, how were you able to work on some on two really different types of comic book movies? Because Dick Tracy is very much like a surreal thing, while in right. Dark Knight is more like a realistic thing. But yeah. you could still have work on something that ma that makes it memorable. So. In the, for our audience to know, how have you felt working on different types of films all these decades of career? And what was like the most fun experience that you had on the makeup department? On oh. on the yeah. Wow. I you know, well that's the whole thing about you know being in the business we're in is that you just never know what you're gonna be on next. And like the really great actors, I guess, you uh you f you find new material to adapt to and learn from and grow from, and I think that's just art. Be you know try or trying to be an artist. I don't like to use the word artist because it's more. I think we're just um, technicians more than anything, but you know it's just learning, just learning new things and learning and then learning new things about like the difference between Dick Tracy and The Dark Knight. As comic book movies, um, you just you just learn more about yourself, I guess, in that process. But um, you know, it all comes down to reading the scripts and the meetings with the directors and the producers and the actors, and just trying to wrap your head around what they've envisioned for like many years since they started writing the scripts. You know, they're they're really they've been dreaming about these projects long before I get on it. So uh, the idea is to just jump on the train and try to get as deep into the material as you possibly can in a short amount of time. And, uh, you know, the idea with Dick Tracy was that uh, Warren Beatty always wanted to stay true to the Chester Gould comic strip. That was very important to him. But we had a situation where Dick Tracy, Warren Beatty, is this handsome guy that is not going to wear, you know, Dick Tracy makeup. And we yeah. have a Madonna who's going to always look like Madonna because that's what people are going to see. So my I, job was to create a design ethic that uh, we could create a flat top character that wouldn't be a cartoon head like you'd see in Disneyland, like a big yeah. cartoon thing. It could, flat top could kind of stand next to Dick Tracy, and visually you could see, you could almost, they didn't stand out too much. And, and as far as The Dark Knight, it was always an organic, real universe that they created. So the Joker, you know, Heath Ledger, had to look like he put on his own makeup. It couldn't never look like the Jack Nicholson makeup in the first Batman, which was incredible. It just couldn't be that because they're just, those universes are two separate universes completely. You look at the Dark Knight and you look at uh, Tim Burton's Batman, and they're kind of like Dick Tracy and the Dark Knight. They're just you know, two different universes. So our job is to just try to translate that, uh, that vision that the director and the producers and the writers have. And if you do it uh, well, then it works out pretty good for you. As we have indeed seen uh, in those beautiful works that, of yours around these years because basically we grew up watching these films and definitely the makeup is something that really stands out so now uh john is going to ask you his second question so john okay la segunda pregunta que tienes para john Sí, eh, yo solo quiero hacer esta pregunta que siempre me emocionaba y es ¿Cómo él ha visto la evolución de su maquillaje en temas policíacos? Hay tres de mis favoritas, Head, Brasco e Insomnia. My favorites. So John's question for you is that how have you seen the evolution of, uh, of makeup in, when it comes to crime movies? Because he's referring to three crime movies that you worked on which were Heat, Donny Brasco and Insomnia. So that's uh, that's basically the question. How have you seen the evolution and also tell us a bit more about uh, the experience with those projects because 
usually when people talk about makeup and effects, they talk about things like what you did on Dick Tracy or something like Robotin did on The Thing. But oh, sometimes uh, when it comes to these more realistic types of movies, like gangster movies or crime movies, uh, sometimes the makeup is like more subtle because it's not flashy or anything, but still it demands a lot of work, especially when you're trying to recreate certain things like gunshots or the personification of a real life person. So how what how did you see the evolution of makeup within that genre? And what was your experience working on those types of films? Oh wow, wow, that's a that's a big question. Because, I mean, my mind goes back to, like, Scarface with Paul Muni. You know, the old gangster films of the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. And, uh, you know, the other films I've done was, like, Year of the Dragon. It was about the Chinatown gang wars. And it was about mm -hmm. that, uh, the, that organized crime, the uh, Tong Wars in Chinatown. And then The Departed I did, where it's about the Irish gangs of Boston. So, um, and then, you know, there's Donnie Brasco and there's, uh, uh, what other films did you mention? You mentioned Donnie um, Brasco. Eat Donnie, Br Donnie Brasco. And right. Himself. Yeah, they're just all, you know, they're, they're just, uh, I just love the gangster movies. I mean, who does it? You know, you look yeah. at Al Pacino and Scarface and, uh, you know, they're just, I, I grew up watching the Godfather movies when I was a kid. And uh, those are inspirations, but yeah, everything has to be realistic in those films. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no uh, other way to go. And, you know, you do your research and, um, you know, the bullet wounds have to look real and the, uh, the, all that makeup effect stuff has to look really authentic. Even the blood. I remember um, on Heat, we uh, did these crime scenes of uh, the bank heist that opens the movie. They hit the armored truck and they mm -hmm. kill all the guards. And um, Michael Mann had the LA forensic detectives check my crime scene to make sure it was forensically accurate. <laughs> so, you know, the bullet wounds and the, and the prosthetics had to have scorching and tattooing uh, from the soot that comes out of a barrel of a gun at that close range. So, you know, those movies like Heat, uh, Michael Mann made me a better makeup artist because I had to do my research. I had to go into uh, forensic pathology books and study gunshot wounds from close range, from four feet, from six feet away, and what happens to the flesh when you're shot in certain parts of your body. But uh, we passed the test on Heat. He had the LA forensics check the crime scenes of the armored truck heist of the dead bodies and the uh, LA forensic said it passed the test. Huh. Uh, we had to do blood that was uh, from the victims that was uh, 10 or 12 hours old. So we had to make sure that the blood trailing from the bodies was forensically accurate because blood goes through life changes and when you die. So all that stuff has to be realistic. And, uh, we tried to make it really real realistic in the heat. Yeah, because Michael Mann is usually one that is about, I mean, he has a very particular style where it's stylized, but it's also realistic. And also because the, the story of heat is based on an actual event of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an officer who hunted down this, uh, this robber. So obviously I read that he, uh, that some of the, you know, some real criminals uh, were interviewed by the actors in order to get uh, like right. an accurate depiction of it. And also the famous anecdote that the Navy SEALs show the shootout scene because the way that Val Kilmer reloads the, the machine gun is yes. like right. one, of the, one of the most accurate um, perceptions. And even you know, real-life soldiers are, aren't that fast, so that's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, didn't Michael Mann rehearse the actors for weeks? with uh, military training mm -hmm. where they they were taught for weeks how to handle the weapons, how to change the magazines and the weapons. So when it's, it's all on screen, man, right? I mean, it's all, it's all about preparation. Yeah, indeed. Now, but on that movie, Michael Mann may be better. 
And I had worked with Michael Mann a few times before that. I, I did a movie called Manhunter back in like 1986 with Michael Mann. It was the Silence of the Lamb story. It was about the Red Dragon. So um, Dollar Hyde and uh, Hannibal Lecter. Mm -hmm. And so I had a little bit of a track record with Michael Mann. So when I got to Heat, I kind of knew how he, he works. Wants. So you better be on your game with Michael Mann because he, he certainly is. Makes great movies. Yeah, and he, and he just got uh, 80, uh, his 80th birthday last week, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. All right, John. So now comes my second question. In all these years of, of, of career, many people have sat in your makeup chairs and you have transformed people in so many ways. Who is that actor or actress that you can say this is the most interesting uh, artist or, or performer that I've worked on? <laughs> it, it, oh, that's a tough question, man. You know, you're really putting me on the spot here. <laughs> that's the idea. <laughs> well, that's good. Actors, actors and actresses, man. You know, it's like, you know, I guess with my track record, I think uh, working with Al Pacino through all these years um, is. Uh, it's really molded me kind of into the makeup artist and, you know, in a professional and personal way, um, how to deal with the actor and to be uh, sensitive to an actor's needs. I think I, I drew a lot from Al Pacino working with him for many, many years. Uh, so, uh, and, and learning about the preparation of the actor. And the, the etiquette of working around an actor, uh, either on set or in the makeup room. Uh, so I, I, Al, definitely, because I've been with him over 30 years now and worked very closely with him for such a long time. Uh, but there are so many other actors and actresses that, you, you know, you, you're working with actors and they're very sensitive people. So... Uh, you you try to draw something from that experience with all of them and try to kind of incorporate it into what you're doing so uh i don't want to sound politically correct here but there's just so many to to name the great you know great ones heath ledger you know i learned about uh with al i learned relaxation to relax and to not be so edgy uh in your preparation and to prepare to you know russell crowe very uh, big on preparation uh, and uh, being ready and uh, that sort of thing. So, yeah, there's just, just so too, too many actors to really name that I've been very lucky to, uh, to have worked with. And uh, let me just tell you, I mean, you know, you talk about the Dark Knight and Al Pacino and all those jobs. They, they make me more well-known. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we do, you know, we do our part, and then the actor. You know, I did, of course, I did the Joker and did Heath Ledger as the Joker, but uh, you know, I mean, he's really making me famous. <laughs> you know, and at the bottom line, it really, it really is that way. Uh, but you, you know, you of course you want to bring something to the table, and you want to do your best and and help the actor uh, get to where he needs to get to. But these actors really. And producers and directors may be what I am today. They really have. <laughs> and you still, and you are still working. So, and yeah. you're still on demand. And that's pretty awesome. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and still more great movies to come because um, one another another movie of yours that we saw on your IMDb was The Irishman. Of yeah. course, this is The Irishman. How was that experience? Of, of course, um, you have Pacino, who has been like one of your most frequent collaborators all these years. But yeah. how, what was the experience about doing that film? Because when I watched that film back in 2019, first of all, I was really expect, excited about it because Scorsese is one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. Mm -hmm. I owe the, the reason why um, I think we're all here is because of Marty. Um, but second of all, it felt like uh, 
like a friends meeting, like friends that haven't seen each other for a long time, gathering together to make uh, a masterpiece. And so can you tell us a bit more about your experience during the Irishman? Well, you know, you brought up a good thing there. It really, uh, being on set, it seemed like that. All, of, all these friends getting together and making this movie. I you know, definitely felt that on the set while we were filming it, uh, seeing De Niro and Pacino together with Joe Pesci. And I, I like you, man, I'm a, a big fan of Martin Scorsese. And um, I had done The Departed. I department headed the makeup on The Departed. So I knew uh, Martin Scorsese from that experience, which was an incredible experience. So to go back into another Scorsese film was like, you know, the icing on the cake to get a second, second go around. And, um, but yeah, the Irishman was just amazing to see all these great actors and Scorsese. I'm a film fan still. It's, I still am not completely jaded by the business. And, uh, but it was great. I remember when we first got started on the Irishman, uh, some of the talk before we started filming was that they wanted me to, do a lot of heavy makeup on Al to make him look younger. And then uh, then it was like, uh, then they brought in the guy from ILM, Pablo Hellman, and he did his camera, you know, the special cameras with the digital. And so we didn't have to go crazy with, you know, Al in the chair for hours, uh, putting all this makeup on him, which I don't think would have worked anyway. But uh, yeah, that was just a heck of an experience. And, you know, to get to work with Al again, it's just, and to see them both, you know, the last time I saw them together was on Heat. So it was like, how many years later, I get to see the both of them together again. It was like, a, it was a lot of fun. And I was yeah. shot all in New York, which, you know, I live on Long Island, so I'm, I'm here in New York. So all I, I could drive to work every day, and that was, that was nice, too. <laughs> yeah, because one thing that Martin Scorsese loves to do is to shoot in, in New York City. I mean, that's... That's yeah. where the turf is. <laughs> he made it famous, man. He at least him and a few others. But yeah, that's that's his turf. Absolutely. Thanks, John, for that answer. Entonces, John, ¿qué otra pregunta tienes para, para bueno, el maestro aquí? Tengo mi última. Y la voy a hacer más simple. Eh, tú hablaste sobre el tema de Al Pacino, ambos, y me pareció excelente, pero... Lo más importante es saber cómo él construyó la esencia de Al Pacino en los temas de cine de, de mafia. Eh, bueno, me doy dos referencias y que me cuentes una experiencia en The Colton Club. Yo moriría en paz por eso. Ok. So, John is asking about, uh, uh, like, coming back to the theme of your collaborations with Pacino as as one of the mo your most frequent collaborators like how you and the actor have found like uh, like a great essence in order to make the characters work and also he would john would love to know uh a, at least an anecdote or about more about the experience of you working on the cotton club because that's one of his favorite movies oh no kidding the cotton club yes yeah You know about that one. That's how you weren't even born yet, were you? No, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I um, know my family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Was... Well, yeah. Well, you know, the thing about working with Al is, um, you know, he has a way of not demanding the how it should look. He He has a very subtle beautiful way to kind of guide you toward what he's thinking for each character. And, uh, and it's just an incredible situation to be in to actually see Al Pacino develop a character and to be a small part of that is just, uh, you know, it's amazing. And he lets you play around it. You know, it's very loose at first, the first few makeups that we try and ideas, it's just talking about stuff. It's not even really doing anything yet. And then, you know, I'll make a few. Th he loves noses for some reason. He likes to try noses. <laughs> so uh, oh, we always seem to be make like on Donnie Brasco, I made all these different kinds of noses for him. And then in the end, he didn't need a nose. And we all knew that anyway. But it was part of the process to help him 
It's like trying on different ties or a jacket or hat. You know, it's just like another way for him to get to where he has to get to. But uh, as far as the Cotton Club, man, that was – see, that was another thing that I, would, I got through the makeup artist Dick Smith. Uh, I was uh, – because uh, Francis Ford Coppola directed the Cotton Club, and Francis wanted Dick Smith to be involved in all the special makeup. And I think Dick was busy on something else, so he recommended me to go in and do the movie and to be kind of work with him as a consultant, Dick Smith. So I'll never forget, I, I think I was like 26 years old when I did the Cotton Club. And uh, I had to go in with, uh, to a meeting to meet Francis Ford Coppola, to meet Robert Evans, the producer. And I think uh, the production designer, Richard Silbert was there. And I think the one of the producers, Barry Osborne, was at this meeting. And I went in with Dick Smith. So we all went to, it was at Astoria Studios where we, were gonna, where we shot the sets on the Cotton Club. And I went in with Dick Smith. And here I am sitting, I'm a 26-year-old kid, about to be in charge of the prosthetics on the Cotton Club with the guys who basically created the Godfather movies. <laughs> you know, it's like, I hope I don't screw this job up. I just hope I do a good job here. <laughs> and it, it turned out really good. And uh, but that was that was a great experience working on the Cotton Club. Got to do all the effects makeup and the Dutch Schultz makeup on James Raymar, who played uh, Dutch Schultz. He's wearing a rubber nose and a whole thing inside his mouth to make his face look fatter. And Dick Smith trimmed his hairline back about two inches. So that was a big makeup that had to be done every day. And then there was all the other effects makeup throughout the picture. But that was, a, that was a great experience because not only did uh, I get to work with Francis Ford Coppola, but Barry Osborne and Richard Silbert would later go on to the movie Dick Tracy. And I think they had a lot to do with uh, giving my name to Warren Beatty and saying there's this guy in New York that does uh, character makeup. You should check him out. So it's interesting how one film can uh, down the road lead to another film. So the Cotton Club was a great experience in many different ways. Yes, and you say that um, we were not even born yet by the time that movie came out, but we got a lot of older siblings or family or relatives with DVDs or VHSs, so we yeah. got a lot of that. <laughs> it's well, a really right. good movie, isn't it, The Cotton Club? I mean, uh, Coppola just redid it. He did like a two-and-a-half-hour version, which yeah. was meant to be the film. Did you see that version? I haven't seen that yet. I don't know if oh. you have seen it. Oh, but John. we will check it out, definitely. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's as it should have been uh, put out. But I think Orion Pictures at the time wanted to trim down and made Coppola trim it. But the, the extended version is beautiful to watch. It's really amazing. Well, John, thank you so much once again for this. Oh. Incredible. Before we go, John, uh, please let us know where we can find you on social media. Oh, yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm, on, I'm out there on Instagram, Johnny underscore Cags. And I'm starting this makeup workshop, which is virtual, where you, mm -hmm. you get me on a Zoom call and we go through all these different makeup things. And so the Makeup Artist Workshop, check it out. And uh, I'm on Facebook and everywhere else. That's awesome, John. And, and I'm here in my shop in, Brooke, in uh, Long <laughs> Island, so it's great. Awesome. And before we go, can you please uh, say hello to Colombia, to the, your Colombian fans out here, and also to a specific fan who is Andres Carvajal. He is the official translator of the show, but he couldn't be here today. So if you could say hi to Andres as well, that would be really wonderful. Hello, Colombia. I want to get down there, man. I want to see you guys. And Andreas, greetings from New York. Greetings Thank from Colombia. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being in this space, John. I mean, you're amazing. We are so happy that we got you. You are. Thank you, John. Thank you. John. For the John, God bless you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Master. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Gene.
thank you for arranging this. No, it was my pleasure, John. Uh, I mean, right. it's an it's an honor to talk to you. I never thought that this opportunity would See? ever come up, uh, but we're both excited about it. So thank you, John, for I'm your for, you. for everything, and hope to see you soon, and hope to see you here in Colombia because you're gonna love, love this. Fire. <laughs> I would love to make it someday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Go All win. right, man. Go Take win. care. Let me know where I can see this. I want to see this. Oh, yes. sure. We, yes, sir. Yes. We, All right, I, guys. Yes, it's posted. We will share it with you. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All you. right. Bye -bye. Wonderful. God bless you. Bye-bye. Right. God bless.